Hi, this is Kevin Trainer, and welcome to my lecture on uh, context diagramming. Uh, we're going to be going through a subset of the slides uh, from Chapter 7 of uh, the Hoffer book, 7th uh, edition. And um, uh, but Chapter 7 has a really interesting uh, title. It's called St Structuring System process requirements. So in uh, at chapter six, we learned about how to interact with the stakeholders and uncover the requirements, elicit them. Okay, well, then we've got to document them somehow um, for uh, a couple reasons. Uh, one is we'd like to be able to uh, show them back to the people we got them for and ask them, did we get that right? Okay. Um, and so uh, the, the requirements that we got, um, they cover a, a number of areas. We, we have functional requirements, which are feature oriented. Um, you can break those in, into those that have to do with process and those have to do with data. And that's what the authors uh, do. And so in chapter seven, we're talking about the parts of the requirements that we're trying to document or structure, the ones that have, have to do with a process orientation. So that's how we come to uh, data flow diagramming in the beginning of chapter seven. So uh, here we are. Uh, data flow diagramming is part of the analysis phase. Okay. and. Again, um, according to the authors, we have requirements determination, which we went through in chapter six. And now we have require, requirements structuring, which is another way of saying uh, documentation or expression. Um, and, and we're beginning on that in, as we get into chapter seven. Um, the approach that we're going to take, this is the first uh, one that we're going to take, is uh, called uh, process modeling. Okay? And um, there are a number of different uh, diagramming uh, systems um, that are commonly used to, to model uh, processes. Um, and uh, data flow diagramming, which is what we're going to cover here, was really one of the early ones. And um, uh, why don't we move from there? What we want to come out with, okay, is some kind of a data flow diagram. Now, when data flow diagramming was introduced in the 1970s, um, it was uh, pretty cool stuff and uh, pretty revolutionary in its day in that um, the whole idea was that the uh, proponents of data flow diagramming had this idea that instead of writing a narrative version of what the, the specifications for the system were in some kind of term paper, we would have a combination of diagrams and these mini specs that would um, give us the details that underlaid the diagrams. And that's what data flow diagrams were all about. So an entire set of data flow diagrams replaced an entire kind of narrative uh, functional specification. Um, and it was thought to be more succinct, more exact, um, more modeling oriented, okay? And modeling oriented in the sense that while you were expressing the requirements, you would do so in a way that you could see the goodness of the model. Um, so at data flow diagramming is still alive and well, but we're not practicing in its, in its entirety. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pick off the low hanging fruit, the, the very big uh, diagram that's at the very top of a series of data flow diagrams, it shows using the data flow diagramming techniques, 
it shows the system as a whole and how that system interacts with primarily users and other systems in the world outside of the system. Okay, and that is called a context diagram, and that's what we're going to learn how to do. The chapter continues on. I don't have you reading the whole chapter uh, because we're not going to do the whole technique. Um, it's interesting stuff and uh, would be worth the time to read if you had the interest, but it's not something that we're going to use beyond context diagramming. So here are the symbols, and um, I mentioned that uh, data flow diagramming, um, uh, which was also called and is also called structured analysis, uh, started in the 70s. And um, the early proponents were Ed Jordan and Tom DeMarco, and they used a set of symbols that were on the left. And the set of symbols that were on the left were, um, were good because of the fact that they could be easily hand-drawn or hand-drawn with uh, templates that you could buy at a stationery store. Uh, and those of us who, who practiced the technique um, really liked it for that. So we would have, uh, oh, a Pentel mechanical pencil and a nice uh, uh, Pentel uh, white rubber eraser. And we would get a lot of copier paper and we would uh, draw all these things up. Well, um, we've been using this methodology a long time. And sometime after that, I'd say sometime in the 80s, there... Um, there was a team called Gain and Sarsen, and they came along and they uh, reinvigorated uh, data flow diagramming and structured analysis. And they came up with uh, um, cooler looking symbols. Okay, and those are the symbols on the right. Now, the ones that we're going to use in our class are the ones on the right because those are the ones that are used in the textbook and those are the ones that are used by the diagrammer and they're prettier. So uh, there are four symbols of which we're only going to use three. Um, uh, the top one, we're just going to talk about the right ones again and Sarsen ones. The top one is a process. Uh, okay. Now in data flow diagramming, a process is really any kind of a process um, it could be a manual process done by people, but usually we're describing the system, and so it's some kind of an automated process. And um, it, 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 it has inputs, uh, which are going to come in these data flow arrows we see down here on the bottom. That's the fourth. And it has outputs, which are going to be represented again by the data flow arrows. Um, the inputs are going to either come from other processes or they're going to come from uh, which what is on the slide here called a source or a sink. Um, more generally, these have been called external entities. So what's an external entity? An external entity is like a user. Okay, it's some person or role or some organization that is going to provide data into the system and input or consume the data that comes out of the system and output. Okay, so they are the users. They're not part of the system. They're external to it. Um, so they're called external entities. Um, an external entity can also be another system our system can interact with other systems as well. And we want to distinguish between the work that goes on in our system and the work that goes on in some other system. Um, the second symbol um, is a data store. And this is something that we don't use in the context uh, diagram because in the context uh, diagram, when you have a single process, as you're going to see, and it represents the whole system. So when data is inside the system, it's just inside the process. Okay, We never see a lower level view. 
if you go on and create a full set of data flow diagrams, well, then you break that down and you do have a, a lower level view. And in those lower level views, it data stores are places where data can come to rest. So um, uh, data flows often flow into a data store where they are uh, persisted and stay there until they're needed by another process. But because we only have one process, and we don't need to buffer things between processes, in a context uh, diagram, we never have a data store. We have one process symbol. Uh, we have a number of external entities. And we have a number of uh, data flows that are um, uh, the inputs and outputs of the system. So let's go ahead and um, look at a context uh, diagram. And here's one on slide nine, okay? This is one from the textbook that's a food ordering system. And um, I'd just like to kind of talk it through. So um, uh, because it's a context uh, diagram, there's only a single process. Uh, it's called um, the name of the system. Now, when, if you look ahead in the chapter, the part that we're not going to cover, you'll see that in the rest of data flow diagramming, that uh, processes uh, have a name of a process, and they're usually action-oriented. They're usually a verb phrase. The one exception to that is on the context diagram. Um, typically, we don't name our system with a verb uh, phrase. We typically have some kind of a name. It's the blah blah system. It's the payroll system. It's the accounts receivable system. It's the order management system, right? It's the food ordering system. So in our case, um, we're going to have a single process symbol. It's going to be in the middle of the context uh, diagram, and it's going to have the name of the system on it, some kind of a noun. And then, as you can see here, we have three external entities. O okay. And they're, um, for the most part, they're, they have the name of a role that somebody's going to play. Like a customer, if somebody plays the role of customer in a transaction of uh, food buying and consumption, right? Uh, if, if this is happening at a restaurant, somebody can, can play the role of a restaurant manager. But a kitchen, that's not really a role. That's maybe a collection of them. Okay, so the kitchen is a place where there might be a chef and there might be a sous chef and there could be, oh, just uh, kitchen workers and all kinds of stuff. So some people are working in the kitchen and they are working with uh, the system. Okay, now let's talk about the rules of a data flow diagramming. It's a, it's a modeling approach, okay? Um, and it's got uh, rules, okay? So, uh, so far, we're, we're following the rules. Um, on a context a diagram, you have a single process. It's named after the system. Check, okay? These external entities are users of a sort of the system, okay? And they communicate with the system through data flows. Check, okay? That makes sense. All right. Um, um, we've not said this about data flows yet, but we're going to say it now. Data flows are nouns, okay? Now, this is a little surprising to some people who are new to data flow diagrams because they say, well, you know, when data is coming into the system or going out of the system, that's very action-oriented. I mean, that's an action, right? 
So shouldn't these things have action names? And um, our answer is going to be no. Okay. When they came up with the methodology, because they're using action names for the names of the lower level processes in the part of data flow diagramming that we're not doing, because we're only using the top level, because they're using action phrases to name the uh, processes, the lower level uh, processes, they didn't want to use the action names for the data flows. So what they really are is that they're names of things, their data, their information. Now, uh, it, it, it is within the rules for um, for a, a data flow to be able it, to represent physical things. Okay, so um, could uh, could we have the food? What, um, you know, could we have physical things that are going to come um, out of the system? Yeah, they could. O okay. Um, but more typically, it's going to be information. So um, between the customer and the food ordering system, we see the following interchange. There's a customer order that comes from the customer. And then there is a receipt that goes back to the customer. Okay. Well, you could see how a customer order would have information on it. And you could see why you would want to call that a noun. And you could see that the receipt would have information on it too. And how that's, a, um, that's appropriately a, a noun. Okay. Um, I want to, I want to uh, tell you, call your attention to the fact that there's no food here. Okay. We could have food. Uh, you know, there isn't anything that says you can't have material things being part of the system but how does the customer get the food well some kind of a server okay will put um will uh take the food from the kitchen when the kitchen when that's ready and they'll bring it and give it to the customer well where's that on the diagram it's not on the diagram Okay, so there are plenty of things that go on in the world, even the world that we care about as a systems analyst, um, that don't make it to the diagram because they're not part of the interaction between the external entities and the system. You'll see people, um, uh, people new to data flow uh, diagrams who want to draw um, a, a data flow that shows the food going from the kitchen to the customer. That's interesting information. It's just not appropriately part of our diagram. Okay, so external entities can have all kinds of interactions with each other or with uh, other parties who don't even appear on the diagram at all. And we're not going to show them because they're not part of this information exchange between the external entities and the system. Okay. Um, now, let's look at the interaction. Well, uh, one more thing to say about the interaction between the customer and the system. Uh, one, you have to ask yourself, is the customer really interacting with the system? Is this a system that's kind of on the table, right? Where, um, you know, the customer, uh, you know, say you sit down at your table and there's a, um, there's some kind of a, a, a computer workstation there, right? And you pick out things and you order them and you tell the system what you want to eat. Well, in a typical restaurant, it doesn't actually work that way. In a typical restaurant, um, the customer is going to interact with some kind of server and they're going to give the server their order. Who is going to interact with the food ordering system? It's really the server, right? The server is going to put the order into the system, okay? The receipt is going to be printed by the system, but it's really going to go to the server and they're going to walk it to the customer. 
Now, if this were some kind of online food ordering, uh, perhaps the customer or, uh, you know, the order is actually coming from the customer and the receipt is actually going to the customer. That's possible. But one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, is the name that we have in this external entity box, is that the real party who's interacting with our system? And I, I just would call it into uh, doubt, okay? This is, I think, a simplified example. Um, and, uh, one of the things I see about the diagram that I like is this uh, kind of circular interaction between customer and food ordering system. There's an order that comes uh, that goes that flows from the customer to the food ordering system. There's a receipt that comes back as an acknowledgement. Okay, I like that. Good um, user system interactions are typically request response. Okay, so when you see these kind of diagrams, and you get a good view of this when you re, um, when you take a look at my tutorial, when you build these kinds of diagrams, you usually have a um, uh, one or more cycles that go on between an external entity like a customer and the system. Now. Go over to the kitchen side. We have a food order that goes to the kitchen and plop. It just winds up in the kitchen, okay? So there's nothing that, that says that the kitchen is saying, I'm ready for an order, okay? Um, and then um, the food ordering system sends the order to the kitchen. Perhaps it prints on a printer there or it displays on some kind of a screen. Uh, or there isn't some kind of a workflow here where the system says, uh, I have a food order ready to go. Are you ready to receive it? And then the kitchen says, yes, I'm ready to receive it. And then the food order goes to the kitchen, right? There isn't anything like this. So you can imagine a kitchen that just has a printer there, right? And maybe... Um, the you know, the people who work in the kitchen have gone on to break so they're outside in the alley uh having a cigarette and um the customers are ordering food and the food orders are just printing one after the next after the next and falling on the floor of the kitchen the customers thinking that their food is being made in the kitchen uh the kitchen people thinking well the customers haven't come in yet and we're okay uh, being out in the alley having a smoke break. So this, I think, is probably not a good uh, design. There's no feedback loop uh, here. So typically, I want to see interactions between uh, external entities like a kitchen and food ordering system be circular. There's a request. There's a response, right? There's a, we're communicating with each other. So I don't like it that that only goes in a single direction. Likewise, between the food ordering system, and the restaurant manager, I don't really like that either. I mean, um, in, in, in the typical modern system, uh, people don't get output unless they ask for it. Okay, so... I could see the restaurant manager sending a request for the management reports and getting back as a response the management reports. Okay, so these two, um, one arrow and one direction um, uh, things that we see, I think are uh, too simplified. All right, I'd rather see them more robust. Okay, now we had uh, a slide before this. So the context uh, diagram is an overview of an entire system. It shows the boundaries of the system. It shows the external entities that interact with the system. It shows the major information flows between the entities in the system. There's only one process symbol 
and there are no data stores shown because all the data stores are inside the system. Okay, and again, if you were to go ahead and look at the rest of the chapter on how to do the lower level diagrams in a full set of data flow diagrams, you would see that we have uh, diagrams that have more than one process on them, and you can see uh, data flows come out of one process and they go into another, or what they might do is that they might take a stop in a, um, a data store in, until the next uh, process is ready to begin. Uh, but of course, we don't have anything like that in a context uh, diagram, so no data stores at all. One of the reasons that we are using context uh, diagrams, and let's go back to looking at one, is that this is a great way for us to uh, talk about what is the scope of the project. Because the scope is um, has a, a, a couple of parts. Uh, who are the stakeholders we're going to solve problems for? Well, right here from the diagram, customer, kitchen, workers, restaurant, manager. We're going to solve problems for other people? It doesn't look like it. They're not on the diagram. They don't interact with our system. If they're going to get some satisfaction, they're going to get it secondarily, not primarily. Okay. Um, what functions go on in the system? Well, you can usually tell what goes on in a system by seeing what goes in and what comes out. Okay. If you don't see it here, it doesn't happen. Okay. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in the organization somewhere. Like for instance, we don't see the food going from the kitchen to the customer. It's not part of food ordering system, okay? Um, it doesn't happen in food or ordering uh, system. Uh, to a certain extent, if it's not part of our system, we don't care, all right? It's not part of the scope. So one of the reasons that we're covering context ed diagrams now um, is we think it's such a great way to start we start to talk about the process of a system. You know, uh, each uh, system is a process, a big one, a complex one. Uh, it has inputs and outputs. Um, and we're going to use those to describe the scope of the work that we're doing in a context diagram. Now, um, there are in the chapter a group of rules Okay, and the rules are very important when taking in terms of uh, data flow diagrams more generally and not just uh, context uh, diagrams. But uh, they're, you know, they're true of context uh, diagrams as well. So let's look at a couple of these from this uh, table 7-2. Uh, no process can have only outputs. Uh, it would be making data from nothing, a miracle. And if an object ha has only outputs, then it must be a source, must be an external entity. No process can have only inputs. It would be a black hole. If an object has only inputs, then it must be a sink, must be an external entity. Uh, a process, other than the process on a context diagram, has a label that's a verb phrase, okay? Uh, on the context diagram, the single process has the name of the system, which typically is not a verb phrase. It's typically a noun. Data stores, we don't care about. Sources and sinks, which we call external entities. Data cannot move directly from a source to a sink. So we don't show data flowing from external entity to external entity. It's interesting information. It's just not part of our diagram. Okay? If it's of any concern to our system, it's going to flow through our system. Otherwise, it's not shown on the DFD. A source or sink, an external entity, 
has a noun phrase label. The data flow, let's look at that. A data flow has only one direction of flow between symbols. Um, there is one case where it can flow in two directions between a process and a data store, but we're not using data stores on the context diagram. So all of the data flows that we have are only going to have an arrow at one end. The data is only going to be flowing in one direction. Uh, a fork in a data flow means exactly the same data goes from a common location to two or more different uh, processes, uh, data stores, which we're not going to use their sources or seeing. So we can, if we have the same uh, data going to two different external entities, for instance, we can show two data flows with the same name, or we can show one coming out of the system and forking and going to the two external entities, OK? Um, uh, we can do the same thing on the, on the input side. If we have the same data flowing from two external entities, we could show two uh, data flows that just happen to have the same name, or we could show them originating at some external entity and then merging um, on the way in. We call that a join. Okay, so when they split apart on the way out, it's a fork. When they join on the way in, it's a join. You can show them either forking or joining or not. Okay, it's okay just to show uh, things of the same name coming from or going to um, different external entities. Um, a data flow cannot go directly back to the same process it leaves. There must be at least one other process that handles the data flow, produces some other data flow, and returns original data flow to the beginning process. So, if we have some kind of internal flow inside of our system, where one of part of our system is going to send data to another part of our system, it won't appear on our context diagram. That's all the innards of the system, okay? Doesn't appear. So we don't have anything that flows out of the system and flows back in. We might think of it that way, but in terms of the way data flow diagrams work, there may be a lot of things that flow internally to the system, but they don't come outside. We don't see them, okay? The area outside the system in the context diagram is the outside world. It's not in the system. Um, a data flow has a noun phrase label, okay? noun phrase. I know a lot of you guys like to think of them associated with action. Forget about it, okay? Data flows are always noun phrases. Okay, so that's it, okay? And these, uh, these rules are even a little bit uh, complex for the fact that we're only creating um, a single process, okay? We want to identify who's interacting with the system. So we need the process with the name of the system. We need the uh, external entities. And we need to show the data flows. And typically, we're going to be showing the data flows going in cycles, OK, in the way that we have for the customer. Something comes in from the customer. Something goes back to the customer, OK? And uh, it, typically what happens if we do, you know, three things with the customer, well, then we're going to see three cycles, three pairs of arrows uh, between the food ordering system and the customer. And as I said before, I don't like these single arrow um, um, relationships between the food ordering system and the restaurant manager in the kitchen. I think there's there's a cycle implied that I'd rather see there explicitly. 
Okay, so that's it. Uh, the place to go to from here is to the um, a tutorial for the skills practice exercise. There are two tutorials. There's one using Visio and there's one using Visual Paradigm. So go to the one that's appropriate for the tool that you're going to use and off you go. So I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye bye.